If you've ever flown on an Airbus A380, you were cruising faster than a Formula One car, over 900 kilometers per hour, while seated inside a double-decker plane longer than two adult blue whales. It's a masterpiece of modern engineering, and today you will find out exactly how it's built from the ground up. The Airbus A380 didn't just break records, it shattered expectations for commercial airliners. Stretching 72.7 meters long with a wingspan of 79.8 meters, almost as wide as a football field. Inside, it can carry up to 853 passengers in an all-economy layout, or around 555 in the more common three-class setup, more than the population of some small towns. Building this sky giant is a monumental task. Each A380 is assembled from over 6 million parts sourced from more than 30 countries. The materials used are cutting edge. 25% carbon fiber reinforced plastic, advanced aluminum alloys, and glass fiber composites make up the structure. Over 500 kilometers of wiring run through the fuselage, linking systems, sensors, and entertainment units. Even the internal pressure system is an engineering feat. At cruising altitude, the cabin is pressurized to simulate 8,000 feet above sea level, protecting passengers from the harsh, near-vacuum environment outside. Each of its four engines inhales about a ton of air per second, all while cruising above the clouds at near supersonic speeds. That's power and precision in perfect sync. The Airbus A380 is so massive that it couldn't be built in just one place. Like assembling a mansion mid-air, each A380 starts as an international puzzle with thousand-ton pieces. The front section and cockpit are built in France and Germany. The giant 50-meter wings come from Wales. The tail is made in Spain and the engines come from either Rolls-Royce in the UK or Engine Alliance in the US. But here's the tricky part. These pieces are huge, too big to fit in normal cargo planes. So Airbus had to get creative. They designed special transport systems just to move the parts. That includes the Beluga XL, a cargo plane shaped like a whale, and custom-built sea barges that carry the pieces along rivers and oceans. Then in France, they use a convoy of trucks to drive the parts along a special route called the Itinéraire à Grand Gabarit. To make that route work, Airbus literally widened roads, reinforced bridges, and even moved street signs just so these giant airplane parts could reach the final assembly line in Toulouse. It's one of the most impressive logistics operations in aviation history. And here's a quick question for you. How many Airbus A380 were built in total before production ended? Drop your best guess in the comments as we'll reveal the real number right before the outro. Once all the parts arrive in Toulouse, the real magic begins. This is where the A380 finally starts to look like an airplane. And it's as complex as building a space shuttle. Giant cranes and robotic arms lift the massive fuselage sections into position. Laser-guided systems make sure everything lines up perfectly, down to fractions of a millimeter. Each wing is attached with 30,000 rivets, and every single bolt is manually inspected. First, they connect the nose, center, and tail sections. Then comes the landing gear, 22 tons of steel and titanium, with 20 wheels to handle the A380's takeoff weight of over 560,000 kilograms. The wings are so wide they won't even fit through regular airport hangars. That's why installation demands extreme precision, measured in micrometers. Once the frame is in place, the aircraft moves to the fitting hall. This is where the interior comes to life. Engineers install everything from oxygen systems and pressurization controls to thousands of seats, in-flight entertainment, and the A380's famous dual staircases connecting both decks. All of this takes around 12 weeks and more than 1,500 engineers just to get the aircraft ready for testing. Every Airbus A380 flies with four of the most powerful jet engines ever put on a passenger plane. Depending on the model, it's either the Rolls-Royce Trent 900 or the Engine Alliance GP7200. Each one produces up to 80,000 pounds of thrust. And to put that into perspective, that's enough power to pull eight fully loaded freight train cars per engine. At full throttle, each engine sucks in over 1.25 tons of air every second. That air is compressed, ignited, and blasted out the back at speeds approaching Mach 0.85. That's nearly the speed of sound. Inside, these engines are marvels of precision. Before installation, 
Each unit goes through X-ray inspections, vibration tests, and full power simulations to catch even the tiniest flaw. Once mounted under the wing, they're synced to the A380's fly-by-wire system, a high-tech digital control setup where the pilot steers using an electronic joystick, not mechanical cables. Even better, the plane has backup computers that take over instantly if something goes wrong, within milliseconds. And yet, thanks to these engines, this 560-ton giant lifts off like it's weightless. These engines help it climb, cruise, and land with the agility of something far smaller. Before a single passenger steps on board, every A380 must prove it's ready for the skies. And that means months of intense testing, both on the ground and in the air. It starts with ground tests. Engineers bend the wings, shake the fuselage, and blast the aircraft with high-pressure water jets to simulate extreme weather. One dramatic test involves the A380 roaring down the runway at full throttle but staying on the ground. Why? To check how the brakes, suspension, and tires handle high-speed stress without taking off. Then comes the real challenge, the maiden flight. Airbus test pilots take the aircraft into the air and push it to the edge of its performance envelope. They test maximum speed, altitude changes, stall recovery, engine response, and more, all in tightly controlled airspace. The first ever A380 flight in 2005 lasted just under four hours and everything went according to plan. Once all systems pass inspection, the plane is painted in the airline's colors like Emirates, Qantas, or Singapore Airlines and officially handed over. From the first part being built to the moment it joins an airline fleet, the process takes about one full year per aircraft. That's one year to build one of the most advanced flying machines in the world. The Airbus A380 started as a bold dream to build something even bigger and more luxurious than the Boeing 747. In the early 2000s, Airbus set out to create the world's largest passenger plane. But it wasn't just about cramming in more seats. The A380 aimed to redefine air travel. Think lounges, onboard bars, and even showers in first class. It was like turning an airplane into a flying hotel. The A380 made its first commercial flight in 2007 with Singapore Airlines and quickly became a symbol of long-haul luxury. Airlines like Emirates, Qantas, and Lufthansa added it to their fleets, but it came with challenges. Many airports around the world had to upgrade their runways, expand gate areas, and retrain staff just to handle the size of this beast. And about that question we asked earlier, how many Airbus A380 were built in total before production ended? The answer is just over 250. That's right. Only 251 Airbus A380s were ever produced before the line shut down in 2021. While that number was far lower than Airbus originally hoped, the A380 still made a massive impact on aviation history. It redefined long-haul luxury, turned heads at every airport, and became an icon in the skies. Emirates alone operates more than half of the entire global fleet. And even though production officially ended in 2021, the A380 continues to fly today, carrying passengers in comfort aboard one of the most remarkable machines ever made. It may not have lasted forever, but the A380 proved that sometimes bigger really is better. The Airbus A380 isn't just a plane, it's a masterpiece of global engineering. Even after production ended, the A380 still rules the skies as a symbol of what's possible when we aim higher, literally. They stomp through sand, mud, snow, and rubble, and still hold strong. We're talking about military boots. Built tough, worn by soldiers, and engineered for survival. But how exactly are they made? Today, we'll cover how these high-performance boots are manufactured, from raw leather to combat-ready pairs. Every military boot starts with a choice of leather. Not all hides are equal and only the strongest, full-grain cowhide or split leather makes the cut. Full-grain offers durability and weather resistance, while split leather, often paired with nylon or canvas, creates lighter hybrid boots for jungle or desert operations. These raw hides are shipped in large rolls to manufacturing plants where they're inspected for scars, thickness, and grain integrity. Each hide is tanned using either chrome tanning which uses chromium salts to make the leather soft, flexible, and highly resistant to water, or vegetable tanning, 
a plant-based method that produces firmer leather with better breathability, ideal for hot, dry environments. Once tanned, they're cut into smaller panels using computer-guided lasers that ensure zero waste and perfect shape alignment. Modern combat boots also feature Cordura fabric, Kevlar panels, or Gore-Tex layers. These synthetic materials are chosen based on the intended terrain, whether that's icy mountain zones or scorching deserts. Every component, down to the thread, has to be certified for military standards, known as mil-spec. And that's just the upper layer. Beneath it all, a surprisingly complex sole system. Unlike everyday sneakers, military boots require soles that can absorb impact, resist oil and chemicals, and maintain traction on uneven terrain. First, the midsole is molded using a material called polyurethane, or ethylene vinyl acetate. These are poured into foot-shaped molds and then compressed under heat, usually around 300 degrees Fahrenheit, to form a cushioned, shock-absorbing base. The key is balance, too soft and it wears quickly, too hard and it reduces mobility. So engineers run tests on rebound, flexibility, and pressure distribution for every batch. Then comes the outsole, the rugged bottom layer. This is usually made from high durability rubber or vibram compounds. Outsoles are cast in thick molds that include tread patterns optimized for grip on wet rocks, loose gravel, or steel surfaces. Once cooled, both layers are joined with strong adhesives and sometimes stitched directly to the boot using Goodyear welting or direct attach methods. These construction techniques determine how long the boot can last in harsh field conditions. And before it even meets the upper, there's one more hidden layer inside. A great military boot has to do two things at once, protect and comfort. That's where the inner linings and reinforcements come in. The inside of the boot is layered with antimicrobial linings to reduce sweat, odor, and bacteria. Materials like moisture-wicking nylon mesh or padded foam linings are bonded to the leather shell, giving soldiers a more breathable and comfortable interior, especially during 12-hour missions. Around the toe and heel, composite reinforcements are added for impact protection. To reduce weight, these aren't steel but instead high-grade thermoplastic or fiberglass toe caps. These can withstand up to 200 joules of force and meet ANSI standards for protective footwear. Shank plates, usually made of nylon or fiberglass, are inserted between the sole and insole to provide foot arch support and resist sharp object penetration. You can step on nails or shrapnel without injury. And yes, ankle padding and heel counters are also molded to create a snug, blister-resistant fit. The last thing a soldier needs in the field, a sore foot. If you're into engineering, gear design, or just love seeing how tough things are built, don't forget to subscribe. Now it's time to stitch the upper and sole together, and here's where the boot becomes truly battle-ready. Using heavy-duty stitching machines, skilled operators sew each leather and fabric panel together following strict patterns. These seams are double-stitched and sometimes triple-reinforced, depending on the boot's military application. The stitched upper is then joined to the sole using two main methods, Goodyear welt construction or direct injection. The first involves a stitched welt, a strip of leather or rubber that locks the upper and sole together, creating a boot that's both waterproof and resolable. The second injects molten polyurethane between the upper and sole, bonding them permanently, faster, lighter, and often used in mass production. After this, boots are pressed in hydraulic molds to fuse the structure under intense heat and pressure, aligning the shape and ensuring zero gaps. Once cooled, each boot is trimmed, de-threaded, and checked for structural alignment. But we're not done yet, now it's time for a brutal series of tests. Military boots don't head out the door until they've been through some seriously tough tests. First, each pair is dunked in water tanks and flexed thousands of times by robotic machines to check for leaks. If even a drop gets through the seams, that entire batch is rejected. Next up is the abrasion test. Boots are rubbed against rough, sandpaper-like rollers for hours to simulate months of wear and tear. Then there's the impact test, where a heavy weight is dropped from six feet right onto the toe to make sure it can handle real-world blows. Some models even go through extreme climate testing. They're placed in special chambers that simulate desert heat, up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, freezing Arctic cold, 
as low as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and swampy humidity, all to make sure they hold up anywhere on Earth. Other pairs are worn by field testers during intense endurance drills to gauge real-time performance. In combat, gear failure isn't an inconvenience, it's a life-threatening risk. That's why no pair gets approved unless it meets the highest standard of reliability. Only the boots that pass every single test move on to the final stage. And that's where the finishing touches like laces, ID tags, and packaging come in. Once a boot proves it can handle the toughest conditions, it's time for the final touches. Durable military-grade laces made from tough polyester or nylon are threaded through reinforced eyelets and speed hooks. Depending on the model, these may be machine-pressed or laser-riveted for extra hold. Some boots also include smart features like drainage vents, side zippers for quick removal, or ID tags sewn into the tongue to help with tracking and inventory. Every boot is labeled with a batch code, showing when and where it was made, plus which materials were used, just in case a recall or inspection is ever needed. After one last check, the boots are paired, stuffed with shape-holding inserts and packed into protective, water-resistant boxes. Then they're grouped on pallets and shipped out to military bases, tactical gear stores, or deployment zones across the world. And if you're curious, yes, each pair is traceable down to the exact minute it was molded. That's how precise and strict military standards are. Combat boots have a legacy that stretches back thousands of years. Ancient Roman legionnaires wore caligae, open-toed leather sandals reinforced with hobnails, to endure long marches across Europe and North Africa. Fast forward to the Napoleonic era, and you'll find early lace-up leather boots being used by infantry, offering better ankle support and foot protection on the battlefield. In the trenches of World War I, soldiers were issued thick, hobnailed trench boots, durable but often waterlogged and cold. By World War II, the U.S. military began standardizing boots with leather uppers and rubber soles, tailored for different terrains. This gave rise to the first real combat boot as we know it. The Vietnam War introduced jungle boots, lighter, breathable, with canvas sides and drainage holes to handle swampy terrain. The Korean War led to the development of cold-weather boots with insulation and waterproofing. Today, armies issue a wide range of mission-specific boots, desert, jungle, mountain, and airborne models. Civilian demand has also grown. The U.S. military alone distributes over 2 million pairs annually, each one built on centuries of evolution and innovation. Military boots are more than just footwear, they're a survival tool. From Kevlar to comfort, every detail is engineered for protection, performance, and longevity. And that hidden layer we mentioned earlier? It's the shank plate, usually fiberglass, that keeps the arch supported and your foot safe from punctures. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that subscribe button and tell us in the comments. Which piece surprised you most? The pressure tests or the smart moisture wicking liners?